I've heard so many people say, it just seems like every relationship I get into, I'm manipulated. Every time I, I offer myself to my friends, they deceive me. God doesn't want that. That's not God's plan for your life. And you can't get mad at God for that. That's the work of the enemy. That's his job. That's his duty, so to speak. It's our job to be able to discern good from evil. Amen? That's our job. He gives us the Spirit. His Holy Spirit, he sends to us. He went to the Father so that the Spirit could come. So that we could be empowered to be witnesses and to operate in the body of Christ with the gifts that he brought. The sermon is one of those gifts. So, in other words, when you get this, when you know the truth, according to God's word, when you know the truth, you will discern the lie. When you, when you truly have an understanding of Christ, because he is truth, his word is truth, when the lie comes, you will know that's not, that's not part of the word. That's not in the word. That's not of the word. That doesn't look like Christ. That don't smell like Christ. And I don't see the humility in, in that like I see in Christ. When you know Christ, when you know the word, you will know when the lie comes. You will know when the deception comes. You will know when the manipulation comes. You will be able to smell it when it enters the room. Oh, it may get you for a week or two or a month or, or six months even. But guess what? The truth will be revealed because the Bible says there's nothing hidden that shall not be revealed. And when it's revealed, guess what? You'll be like, oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you for revealing that. Some comes quicker than others. But either way, at the end of the day, you would, when you know the truth, you will discern the lie. When you know the truth, you will discern when you are being manipulated. When you know the truth, you will discern when you are being deceived. Does that make sense? Here's the problem with many people. They think they know the truth because they've been in church. Most of their life, some of them. Me, me to be included. We think we know the truth because we can quote the Bible. Because we have memorized scripture, we think we know the truth. We think someone else knows the truth because they can quote the scripture. You better believe the devil can quote the scripture too. You, you get what I'm saying? The enemy has deceived many people to think this way in the body of Christ. But the reality is, when they face the battle and or engage in the warfare without really knowing, they end up throwing in the towel. They end up quitting. They end up falling apart. Who in here wants to fall apart when the storm comes? Who in here wants to fall apart when the, when the Category 5 hurricane comes across your doorstep? Who in here wants to fall apart when the tornadoes of life come full force with 155 mile an hour winds ripping and shredding everything in its path? Some of you know those people. Amen? None of us want that. But the reason for this is because their compass of truth you know what a compass is, right? Right? It determines true north and every direction from there. It's because their compass of truth is miscalibrated. See, it's funny because before church I was talking to Timothy, and Timothy brought up the word talking about calibration. I have not heard the word calibration from anyone or anywhere or anything. This was a major confirmation that, like, your, your, your true north is set right for today. So your compass, 
being a pilot, we have to calibrate our compass in order for it to read true. There are many tools that we use in the earth today to calibrate. It brings balance and weight. Is that, did I say that right? This part ain't in my notes. I didn't do this part. But I'm not a mechanic, so I don't use a whole lot of physical tools. But I know like a torque wrench has to be calibrated so that if it is to, uh, if you're to tighten this lug nut at, you know, whatever, 50 foot pounds per, per, per inch or whatever it is, right, and it's miscalibrated, it won't be torqued to the right pressure and you, you, you take the risk of losing your wheel going down the road, which is how one of my friends got put in the hospital this last week, a tire came off a truck, bounced across the highway, hit her in the windshield. She went into the other lane and hit a car head on, and all of them were life fired. But praise God, not one of them died. I knew that God was in that deal totally, and they're all recovering in Jesus' name. And thank you for it. But nonetheless, calibration is vital. And our compass of truth must be calibrated to the word of God. The word of God is our balance and our measures that we balance and measure everything from. It is the baseline of which we live. When I went to Marine Corps Recruit Depot, MCRD is what it's called. Uh, It's basically uh, the facility where you go to boot camp for 12 weeks. When I went there, we we were assigned to a platoon. Okay, my platoon number was 1077. I'll never forget it because my life was different ever since that day. And in that platoon, when we showed up and we, you know, they have all these little sets of yellow footprints and you roll out of that bus or those buses and everybody goes to a set of yellow footprints while they're yelling and screaming at you, you know, uh, you know, all these wonderful, nice gestures, um, There was around 90 of us that first day, 90, about 90. I want to say it was exactly 88, but I rounded up. It doesn't matter, okay? The number does not exactly matter. But there was a lot of us who was assigned to platoon 1077. Every one of those 90 men believed with all of their heart that they were going to be a Marine, every one of them. They had told their friends, they had told their family, they had been looking forward to this for months on end. Some, like myself, had dreamed of it since I was a little boy. This is all I wanted to do. This is what I was meant to be. This is what I was bred for, was to be a Marine and defend our freedoms in America. And all 90 of those men went there that day to become a Marine. Understand this, people don't just join an elite fighting force without being completely confident, completely convinced that they have what it takes to finish. No, the people that don't have the confidence to become a Marine, join the Army. No offense. No offense. It's just a point I'm trying to make, praise God. I love all my Army fellas, my other Army brothers, I do. But I wouldn't be a Marine if I didn't crack a joke about it. But anyway, okay? Because that's how we military people roll, right? They got, you know, they got funny sayings for us too. But we're, we're brothers and we know it. But here's the thing. Out of around 90 people who were assigned to that platoon that day on July 9th, 1988, only 46 of them became Marines. 46. Yeah. They quit. They threw in the towel. They couldn't cut muster is what they say. And why is that? Why did so many not make it? Now, I can't speak for the Marine Corps today because, you know, I'm an old man today and it's been a long time and I know the Corps has evolved into something else. But nonetheless, 
Why did so many quit? Some didn't just quit. Some, some fell out because their bodies could not withstand the force that was put against it. They couldn't handle, you know, the cold rain out there being, you know, in the middle of the night at three in the morning, just being showered with rain while they're doing push-ups and bends and thrusts in the, in the, in the middle of the night being doused with, you know, cold water. They couldn't handle, you know, the, the, what I like to call the first phase of waterboarding. They couldn't, their bodies just couldn't handle it and their bodies broke, some of them. There were some that broke bones. There were some that, you know, just couldn't, their, body, their physical bodies just couldn't handle it. But most of them, they mentally quit. And the reason for that was because their mental compass of what they believed was their truth was miscalibrated. They thought they had what it took to be a Marine but boot camp proved them different. You see, boot camp is not war. Boot camp prepares you or equips you to go to war. And it's just the first phase. They thought, they believed with all of their heart within themselves that they could do it, that they could make it. They, their truth about themselves proved to be false. What they believed they could do turned out to be a lie. Not that they were lying to their family, don't misquote me. They weren't who they thought they were. They couldn't accomplish what they said they could accomplish. And therefore they quit and they threw in the towel. God doesn't want us quitting and coming up short. He wants us to finish, and he wants us to finish strong. He wants us to run the race. He wants us to fight the good fight of faith. And you can confess the word till you're blue in the face, but at some point you're going to have to walk it out. And you don't walk it out without people, and you don't walk it out without pressure that comes from within or from around you. The pressures of life and the darkness that rules your flesh. And in order to do that, to be able to finish strong, we have to calibrate our spiritual compass to the truth of God's word because God's word is 100% calibrated correctly. It doesn't get miscalibrated. It is what we calibrate to. It is the standard of which we go by, the standard, the measure of which we live by. And so when we feel like the whole world is coming against us, when your feelings, like many of those recruits, because they weren't Marines, they were recruits, like many of those recruits, their feelings were telling them they can't do this anymore. When the enemy is filling your thoughts with lies, when, the, when you have known the truth, you will have known the truth and therefore you will have what it takes to keep persevering. You will finish your race. You will have developed what it takes to stay the course and be all that God said you could be.